When Steve Jobs walked out on stage in August of 1998, 10 months after Apple's new management team had taken over, the company was in trouble. On September the 30th, 1998, they announced that they'd shipped 278,000 iMacs in the past six weeks, the fastest shipping Mac to date. iMac is iconic to Apple, so today we're gonna to talk about its history, where it is right now, and what we're expecting to see in the very near future. For the latest Apple news, rumors, and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. I'm iCave Dave, and if you want to all the latest Apple news every weekday, smash the like button 2021 style, and if you subscribe and ring the bell too, make sure you post hashtag notification squad up in the comments so that I can say thanks in the next one. To understand iMac, you have to look back at the beginning of the Mac, the original 1984 Macintosh 128K. Released 36 years ago in January of 1984, the Macintosh made its big debut in the Ridley Scott 1984 commercial, played during the third quarter of that year's Super Bowl 18 on CBS. It wasn't super powerful even for the time, with a 9-inch monochrome display, a 7.83 MHz Motorola, 68,128 kilobytes of RAM. But just look at it. It's so recognisable that it shares its design DNA with the iMac. A single unit that includes the display, I.O. and all the computing hardware in a box with an external keyboard and mouse. That mouse, along with the graphical interface, was pretty unusual in 1984, where the competition was almost exclusively command line interface. But it was one of the first computers to be reasonably easy for normal people to understand. The original Macintosh was pretty underpowered and pretty expensive, costing $2,495 in 1984, which is the equivalent to just over $6,000 today. It's low sales along with high price, and Steve Jobs' refusal to work on the Apple II line because he wanted to stay with the Macintosh team were pretty large contributing factors to his impending departure from the company that he founded. Now, Steve did keep busy while away from Apple, founding Next Computers and buying a little graphics company from Lucasfilm in 1986, which he would remain the CEO of until he sold Pixar to Disney in 2006 for $7.4 billion in stock, making Steve the largest single shareholder in Disney, only 7% and gaining a seat on the board. Next Computer wasn't too shabby either, with Tim Berners-Lee using a Next Computer in 1990 to create the first web browser and the first web server. In December of 1996, Apple announced their intention to acquire Next, mainly for the Next Step operating system, which became the foundation of Mac OS X, as well as bringing Steve Jobs back as a consultant and later iCEO. When he arrived, he ripped out many of the company's product lines, upsetting a lot of people along the way who'd worked hard on things like the Newton line, and removing confusing lines like the Optima, Performer and more. Jobs wanted to simplify the range so the company could refocus with a mobile and desktop option for consumers and professionals. And the first release was iMac, the consumer desktop. The original iMac's design and visual style was stunning. A complete change from the beige boxes of the time. It was simple to set up, just plug in your power, keyboard and mouse and you were good to go. Though the less said about that mouse, the better. It was circular, so it was just as easy to grab sideways or at an angle, which would send your cursor off in exciting and innovative directions. But then you could also just plug in a phone line to connect to the internet or ethernet if you happen to be at a business or educational institution or somewhere that had local area networks. It almost wasn't called iMac though. Steve Jobs at the time was a huge fan of Sony as a technology company and was advocating for the name MacMan, inspired by Sony's Walkman line, to evoke the portability of this 34.7 pound or 15.7 kilogram unit, which included a handy carrying handle on the top, just like the original Mac. Originally introduced in Bondi Blue with a 233 MHz PowerPC G3 processor, ATR Rage graphics and 32 megabytes of RAM, along with USB connectivity and optical only media drives. 1999 brought five new colors and 2.66 and 333 MHz options. The G3 iMac got four more revisions through to 2001, getting up to 700 MHz processors with up to one gigabyte of RAM, with the final G3 Max sold in 2003. iMac G4. The iMac G4 brought LCD displays to the mainstream for desktops, and while Steve joked about just making the old style iMac and cutting the back off, the decision was made to allow each part of the computer to be true to itself. The relatively lightweight display was suspended on a super easy to move arm above the computer in its half sphere base and looked reminiscent of the Luxo lamp from Pixar's famous short film and logo. These Sunflower iMacs, as they were known, 
range from 15 to 20 inch displays with 700 megahertz to 1.25 gigahertz G4 processors and up to NVIDIA GeForce FX 5200 graphics. Alongside the iMac G4, the eMac filled in for the more price sensitive education market, keeping CRT displays at 17 inches to help keep the costs lower. Interestingly, the G4 iMac was the only one that used external speakers in a pair of orbs developed in conjunction with Harman Kardon, as every other iMac has integrated the speakers into the main design, and in general, they've always been pretty decent. iMac G5. The G5 iMac looks surprisingly familiar when compared to the iMacs of today, with an LCD display and all the guts suspended on a single aluminium foot, allowing it to tilt up and down, all of the I.O. on the back of the display and a deep chin under the display itself. Other than the materials used, the actual design language of the iMacs of today is clearly dating back to these 2004 Macs. Built of white polycarbonate, they clearly shared much of their brand image with the iPods, featured 1.6 to 2.1 GHz G5 pound PC chips, and up to two and a half gigabytes of RAM. Intel iMacs with Core Duo. The G5 iMacs design was carried directly over to the first Intel Macs in 2006, with 17, 20, and slightly later 24 inch display sizes, with the largest including 1920 by 1200 display panels, offering native 1080p content for the first time in an iMac. In 2007, the iMac got a full redesign, throwing out polycarbonate and bringing in aluminium and glass, though with a plastic backplate. The aluminium frame surrounded the display in these with glass bezels rounded each corner and offered 20 and 24 inch sizes. This design lasted three generations up to 2009's October refresh and featured up to 2.93 GHz Penryn Intel chips and up to 8 GB of RAM supported. The 2009 unibody iMac is indistinguishable from the front angle to the latest Intel iMacs of today. Though from the side they have a much thicker edge and offered optical drives still. Displays changed to 21.5 inch and 27 inch displays with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio and brought up to 3.8 GHz Sandy Bridge Intel processors. In October of 2012, Apple introduced the slim unibody iMac design, which is still the current one at the time of recording. The magnetic display glass was replaced with a glued in place glass, meaning that any internal upgrades or repairs required cutting the glass off the computer. It sounds more dramatic than it is, but it's certainly not convenient. So we're basically back at the present. In 2014, the display resolutions gained retina designation, doubling pixel counts in both directions with 4K iMac 21.5 inch models and 5K 27 inch systems with up to 10 core Comet Lake, 3.6 gigahertz i9 chips and the option now to go all the way up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. Of course, Apple also put out the iMac Pro in 2017 as something of a stopgap while the Mac Pro was still on the horizon, bringing a beautiful space grey finish, Xeon W chips with up to 18 cores, expandability of up to 512 gigabytes of RAM, and Vega 64X graphics. It's an absolute beast, but a beast that hasn't seen any love since it was first introduced, so whether it's something that will continue to exist going forward is anyone's guess. So now we come to what Apple has in store for the iMac with Apple Silicon iMacs. Apple Silicon has already arrived and revolutionized the Mac Mini, the MacBook Air, and the MacBook Pro 13 inch in the entry level products. And their performance is overtaking a number of their higher priced siblings, even if people are sad that they can't plug in an eGPU or a bank of monitors right now. I get it, I'll be coming down from three to two displays when my Mac Mini arrives. All that being said, the upcoming processors, and I've done a lot of other videos on this sort of thing, um, should fix those minor issues as well as adding way more performance. The M1 right now, if we're looking at pure Geekbench numbers, in single core destroys every other Mac ever, and in multi core beats every Mac notebook ever, sitting right between the 2013 12 core Mac Pro and the 2019 Mac Pro 8 core, with only the iMac Pro and iMac with i9, 9900K, and 10, 9, 10Ks above it, along with the 12, 16, and 24, and 28 core versions of the Mac Pro, which top out at over $50,000. Even the integrated graphics sit around an NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti's performance in terms of Metal and OpenCL. So the M1X that we expect to come in the first Apple Silicon iMacs is likely to push the SoC to 12 or 16 cores up from 8 in the M1 with 4 of those remaining as efficiency cores and 8 to 12 performance cores. The single core performance will be fairly aligned with the M1 with just more cores added to the performance side and more cores most likely added to the current 8 core GPU too. The OpenGL score for the 8 cores is around 18,300 so doubling the cores there would put it in the region of an 
AMD Radeon Pro 5300 and NVIDIA GTX 1060 with six gigabytes of VRAM. Now this is assuming they just double the cores, we'll see. But remember how the iMac has basically looked the same since 2009, at least from where you'll be sitting while you use it. Those inch thick bezels are looking pretty chunky for 2021 and generally the design is starting to look a little bit aged even if it is still iconic and cool. The display sizes have been the same since 2009 as well so what could a 2021 version of the iMac give us? For starters it seems that everyone's expecting bigger displays and that does make sense as you can see Apple has consistently increased display sizes over the years. And with smaller bezels, we can fit bigger displays without increasing the footprint too much. Expect 23 to 25 inch smaller iMacs and 30 to 32 inch for the larger ones, most likely with 5K and 6K panels coming to each respectively. At least that's my hope. Otherwise, we're just reducing the pixel density by making the same number of pixels spread over a bigger panel. So fingers crossed we get to make the most of those extra inches for more productivity. We could well see some rounded corners being added to the displays too, a la iPad Pro and iPad Air. Apple Silicon also has the image signal processors from the iPhone as a trick up its sleeve, which is why even with the same 720p webcams in the MacBooks, the video coming out of it looks much better. The problem is that the MacBooks have very thin lids and it's near impossible to squeeze bigger and better sensors in there. But assuming that the iMac takes the iPad Pro and iPhone design language with razor thin edges being a thing of the past, replaced by this little slab of metal, there will be plenty of depth for a 4K FaceTime camera if Apple decides that that would be a good idea. And with Zoom, Teams and more being the way that we work in 2021, at least for the beginning, better quality is going to be better. YouTubers could even use that built-in camera for live streams that don't look like they were shot on a potato. A bright future indeed. Also, where Apple's notebooks have had Touch ID built in, the iMac with its wireless peripherals would be a perfect candidate to include Face ID Unlock. And please let it do multi-user support. Just as the HomePod recognizes the voice of different family members and gives contextual answers, let the iMac know your face, knowing who to log in whenever they sit down in front of it. I've said it before too, but this would also be an amazing win for education, logging in whichever student sits down and being able to verify that the right person is even taking any sort of electronic exams. The main reason that Touch ID wouldn't be as practical in these is because with a wireless keyboard, you would have to have uh, an A-series processor of some sort built into the keyboard, adding a lot of cost in order to get that secure enclave for the Touch ID sensor. And speaking of wireless peripherals, the Magic Mouse with its current shove a lightning cable into the bottom elegance could well be easily fixed with MagSafe. Same for the Magic Keyboard and trackpads. And build a MagSafe charger into the foot of the iMac. An easy charging spot for your iPhone at the desk too, and you can throw on your peripherals at night to give them a little top up. I've said for a while too that if the stand lets the iMac move down further, folding down to an easel or drawing board angle of around 30 degrees would make a great experience with Apple Pencil though I don't think regular touch support would be a great experience. And of course, it will support more external displays than M1, probably way more if you choose to daisy chain them, but certainly at least two external displays. Input and output wise, I think Apple may drop to a couple of USB-A ports, four USB-C, a high-speed ethernet option, but perhaps the SD card may finally go away. I know it'll annoy some, but maybe Apple will keep it around and we can move it onto the side instead of right around the back. We can dream. And from a more frivolous point of view, I'd really like Apple to bring a splash of colour to the iMac. It would be a great throwback to the original G3 iMacs that we talked about at the top of this video, as well as fitting in with the iPhone and iPad lines, which now come in some cool colours. At least give us space grey or something, but I'd love to see something like a product red or a Pacific blue arriving on the iMac. Let us express ourselves a little. But what would be your dream iMac, and what are the features that you would need to make it worthwhile for you? Let me know down in the comments. And before we go, I mentioned Notification Squad at the top of this video, and we have a new member, Stanley Nash. Thank you so much for joining our Notification Squad. If you want to join him in there, all you need to do, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell, and then let me know using the hashtag Notification Squad down in the comments so that I can thank you at the end of the next one. And for now, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.